You are now listening to The Jason D'Amico Show. Greetings, folks. Welcome back to The Jason D'Amico Show. It is so great to have you all with us again. And special uh, shout out, as always, to Simplecast, our fantastic distributor, and YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and the works for getting the show out there. And thank you to you, the subscribers and the listeners. Uh, really excited about our episode and our guest today, as as we always are on the show, because every guest is just phenomenal and fantastic in their own right. But today is really, really special for you. Our guest today is a singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, and music producer who has co-written the international hit single Just Feel Better for Carlos Santana, uh, featuring Steven Tyler. He is also the keyboardist and backing vocalist for the legendary rock band Aerosmith, The Hollywood Vampires, which is with Johnny Depp, Alice Cooper, and Joe Perry, and The Joe Perry Project. His own performance and rendition of the hit song Just Feel Better has recently released on February 23rd of this year, and he's also worked with other notable acts such as the Doobie Brothers, Tal Bachman and Bob Rock, just to name a few. The list goes on forever. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Mr. Buck Johnson. It is so great to have you, my friend. Welcome. Hey, so great to be. Thanks, Jason, for having me, man. We're 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 so excited to have you. And uh, like I was saying right before we went live, um, when I got your press kit from Danielle, just super super beautiful press kit. Really enjoyed just seeing all the the great accomplishments you've had in your career. And um, there, there's really no way possible that we can hit everything in this interview today, but I'm going to attempt to really hit some of the strong bullet points. And I, I'd love to, to first start with um, kind of your beginning stages. I was reading up on um, your background growing up in Alabama and would love to also hear about uh, your family band or something going on with gospel at a really young age. would love to hear about how that started. Yeah. Well, I, I come from a family of singers, musicians, um, and my mom is a great piano player, still plays. Every set. Southern gospel music, which is kind of the matching suits, quartet music that was really popular in the 50s and the 60s in the South. It's really what Elvis wanted to be before, uh, you know, he became who he is. Yeah. And uh, so they had that and they got me up singing. Mom says I was singing before I was walking. And, and of course, you know, there was 24 seven in the house, her playing, everybody always singing different variations of the group within the family, me and my dad, and my sister, me and my cousins and, you know, me and mom and dad and whatever, you know. And uh, so we would sing every weekend uh various churches and saturday night singings and on sunday they would have this thing called all day singing and dinner on the ground where we would roll up in our van in our trailer the johnson brothers quartet and uh unload our custom pa uh, system column speakers and nice. they would have dinner on the ground which is outside casseroles fried chicken all those things that are not really the best thing before you had to get up and sing. Right. And then uh, they would sing, you know, and then uh, a break and there'd be like what they call a love offering, uh, which is to pay for the gas, whatever. So they didn't really do it for the money. They did two albums, um, which are both fan The second one, especially, I mean, they just did it in a weekend live and mixed it. And it's amazing, you know, just brothers singing in harmony, you know, of course they're going to yeah. have a natural blend. And uh, so I, you know, I love singing harmony and that's, uh, you know, every band I was in starting in junior high, when I started hearing songs on the radio and I wanted to, you know, learn to play those songs and, you know, radio was different when I was growing up, it was more variety, you know, you would hear, you know, a Barry Manilow song and then you would hear a Queen song, you know, right after that, you know, it'd be whatever was in the top 40, which meant 40 new songs a week. They haven't done that in decades so right. uh it was pretty special to grow up in that era where <clears throat> you know and fortunately i had some older cousins you know who because there was no rock and roll in the house uh just because my parents were into gospel and classical music great roots uh but um you know i had some older cousins that say here you need to know these guys this is the beatles this is the rolling stones this is led zeppelin and 
you know, I would take those uh, albums, those vinyl albums in my bedroom and had a little crappy little uh, vinyl record player and put on the headphones and and just taken to this new exotic world that I've never heard before, but I loved. And I took to all those English bands that were influenced by the very thing I was growing up singing. And uh, so, you know, that's kind of where I started leaning towards. And, you know, so in junior high, what do you do? You put a band together and in high school and you play at all the skating rinks and the pool parties and, you know, and uh, to get the girls, you know, of course, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's where it all starts. I mean, I was a shy kid, you know, and I, you know, anyway, and then uh, that goes to college and then you play in frats and, and bars. And then uh, after, you know, so that's where it all started. Thanks to my family. So you, you listed a couple of major uh, influences, um, the yeah. Beatles, Zeppelin. You know, I was curious to to see from you if there was that one specific album or moment. Like for me personally, it was uh, Deep Purple Machine Head, where my mind just yeah, exploded. Great. Right. So sure. I was I was I was curious to see if you had one or two or three of those those type of like fundamental albums for you. And what what were they that really just? Well, it's hard to pick just one because they yeah. all had the. Uh, a share a hand in that and I could list a few moments. One that always comes to mind is when I was given who's next and I put that on and I hear, you know, Bob O'Reilly come on in that sequencer, the sequence synthesizer. And, and it just sounded like this is, what is this? You know, <laughs> this is, I'm, 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 I'm on board immediately. And then you go into uh, every song, you know, when they made albums, every song flowed into the next, you know, yeah. right after Bob O'Reilly goes into Bargain and it's just beautiful, exotic, beautiful guitar work at the beginning of that song. And then you get, by the time you get to Behind Blue Eyes, you get this beautiful harmony and I'm like, okay, you know, that's what I'm used to singing and hearing. And then they kick it in gear and you're like, okay, where's this going? You know? And by the time you get to one feet fooled again and you hear that primal daltry scream, oh I'm yeah. Like, wow. You can you can do that? You know, it's like it was I was it's almost scared me, you know, and that was what was <laughs> good about it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's nobody screamed growing up where I, well we sang, but I would say this though that they definitely had the same visceral command and attention like singing in churches and these are backwater churches where i always jokingly say it was just short of snake handling you know <laughs> where they, they would shout speak in tongues you know yeah, and yeah. all this stuff and it, bass and drums it was rocking man and it, it was the same spirit as, as a, you would get at a rock concert it's really right. no different it's the same same energy you know and um and those kind of singers it was really you had to Seeing the gospel, you had to bring it and they had to believe you, you know, the conviction. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's it's the same thing, you know, it's just a different uh, used to say those who could really sing really high and loud and especially women, they say, well, she's got a set of leather lungs, which meant, you know, she could really bring it, you know, just really had volume. And um, so, you know, Daltrey definitely has leather lungs and that's meant as a big compliment. So for sure. Yeah. We saw him, my dad and I saw him, I think he was opening up for Clapton back in like, mm -hmm. I want to say 2010. I was, I was whatever, 15, 16 years old, somewhere at that time. And he brought it. I mean, he just, it, it wasn't the who, mm -hmm. but it was, it was Daughtry and friends or whatever yeah. it was labeled as like, God, if this guy's doing this at whatever, 60, yeah. 65, whatever his age was, it was like, man, this guy, I mean, yeah. he literally sounds like. And he worked it every day because I, I saw in an interview, he's just one of those guys like Mark Farner or, you know, these mm -hmm. guys, they, they they just took care of themselves, you know. Well, and the ones who did are still bringing it, you know, including Steven Tyler. Yeah, and, Steven Tyler, absolutely. They, don't, they, they only know one way to do it, you know, and it's never phoned in and it's all real, you know. Right. Um, they just soon not get on stage than to have it uh, faked. So uh, there's certainly a different era of singers and performers for sure. So you shifted at one point in your career to California. Um, mm -hmm. And I also see on here, you and I have a lot in common. Uh, one, one of the things specifically though, which is not too in common in the, in the artist industry uh, industry of the arts is, is having a business degree. I've got a business degree as well. 
um, just from William Peace University in Raleigh, North Carolina. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, just well, I went to call. I mean, say this. I, I went to the small liberal arts college in Birmingham, Alabama, where I'm from, Birmingham Southern, which is a great school. Yeah. And the only reason I went because I wasn't going to go to college. I was just going to get a band. I was going to go to Nashville, maybe, even though I'm not, you know, a country music person. Uh, I just knew there was great songwriters and great studios there, and musicians, and it was closer to home. Um, anyway, my mom was smart enough. She's brilliant, really, to get a job at Birmingham Southern before I graduated high school. Uh, she was the bookkeeper, the manager of the bookstore. And at the time, employees, their children got to go tuition remission. So I got oh, to go wow. for free. Wow. Outside of paying and things like that sure so i just had to get the grades and i think i got in by the skin of my teeth into college because i already had a band i think the night before my acts uh i had a, a band party somewhere and i probably had a couple beers or more and uh, <laughs> i forgot you know and i'm like oh yeah you got acts in the morning you know you got to be there at eight o'clock i'm like oh okay so i skimmed through it i barely i got just enough to get in i'm like okay i'm in you know, oh, you should take it and make better. I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. Well, I, I studied voice and piano and some of that stuff. I, you know, they were they, Birmingham Southern has a tremendous history of a great fine arts program. And I like, I'm, but they, you know, these kind of musicians that go and play at concert halls and at the Met, you know, and sing. And I'm like, I'm not that, but I got a good foundation. Like, you know, my voice teacher said, I'm going to teach you what you already know yeah. and point those things out and help you eliminate some bad habits that can give you sustainability in a longer career, which he was right. And that was really um, great foundation, another great foundation to work off of. So thanks to David Smith. Um, and anyway, and that's where I met my wife, Kim. So I stayed and then she was a year ahead of me. She graduated. And then a year later I graduated. And then we took off to California, to Los Angeles. So you're in California. Mm. Walk me through kind of that whole scene right De definitely different culture than the the southern yes. roots of the united states and uh you know working working that part of your career going up into into it sounds like you know multiple hats production songwriting performance what yeah. what what was kind of your goal at that point as far as you know everybody wants to make it anybody's going out there you know sure but you know Specifically, what what were your thoughts at that time and and going out to to L A or California? Well, it was scary, you know. Yeah. It was fish out of water for sure. Um, and I love California, and for many reasons. And uh, I probably wouldn't have gone if my wife Kim hadn't encouraged, because she was pursuing acting, and we thought, well, let's give it a try, you know. So that made a di huge difference, and you know, it was. And, and the thing about Los Angeles, and we lived all parts of Los Angeles. We started in the Valley where it's cheaper and it's it's not cheap, but it's cheaper. Sure. And then we moved over the side of the hill and uh, and then we've, you know, into the 310 area code, uh, West L.A. And mm -hmm. then um, and then eventually at Venice Beach. And so we lived in a little 600 square foot apartment for about 10 years or more in Venice Beach. But, you know, we're right there at the beach and it was amazing. Um, but I think, you know, initially it was to be a lead singer. I mean, I'm, I'm a singer first and I asked what I started doing as a kid and learning to sing harmonies. And then I learned to play piano so I could accompany myself and then write songs. Yeah. And I, I, I probably could have stuck piano longer and been more proficient because I had no intention of being a keyboard player. It's just something, it was a tool. And I learned how to play guitar on my own in you know, high school and, and um, but I never took lessons. I took lessons in piano and that was great. And um, and my teacher was mad when I quit because I was doing too many things. And and um, <laughs> but I and, I, you know, you go to L.A. and you have these, you know, these ideas. I mean, we were just excited to be there to get out of nothing against Alabama. We, I love my upbringing and, and it's a wonderful um, state in many ways. And uh, I love the progressiveness of California too, though. And, and the fact that the world lived on my block, 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a great learning experience in life when you travel. But when you live with people from different walks of life in different parts of the world, it teaches you a lot. And, and it firms some of your uh, roots that uh, are true and ring true to you and maybe changes your mind on other things. So it was a great growing uh, era of our lives. And, um, and you know, I, I took to any gig I could get. I was waiting tables. I sold stun guns to truck stops, you know, uh, it sounds crazy. I know it is. <laughs> and whatever job I could get, you know, being a courier, delivering stuff. But at the same time, I'm taking, oh, this guy will pay me 75 bucks to go play his gig, you know, at the Coconut Teaser on a Tuesday night. Right. Where there's six other bands playing and you play your 45, 30 minute set and get your stuff off the stage because next man's up, um, you know, and it, they don't pay for parking. So that 75 bucks just went down to 65 and, you know, it was hustle, you know, and you yeah. had to do that. It did a lot of that. And, and it, it, it reaped some benefits. Some of those people I first met in LA are still friends. And some of them, many of them have gone on to be successful. It's interesting though, you know, you all have an idea of what you want to be, what you want to do. And sometimes life and if things change, or maybe you find that you fall back into this and that's really, you know, some guys end up being in, um, you know, a music publisher as a, or a songwriter instead of an artist. And, um, you know, um, I got work because they said, Oh, you also play keys. Okay. Well, we need a strong singer, you can also play keys and, and some guitar. That got me work. And so, you know, I had a few bands, some that were almost going to be the next big thing. And it didn't work out. It's hard. I mean, it's amazing if a band can ever work out. That's what makes bands like Aerosmith or the Rolling Stones so incredible that mm -hmm. they've lasted over 50 years. Um, and, you know, and as always in each one of those cases, it was a few things lightning struck in the right time or right place. They met the right person or this happened. If it hadn't happened, they would never maybe ever made it. And so all those things come into play the luck, but it's part of the persistence and being in the long game. So, yeah, you know, 17 years in Los Angeles, I always was working in some variation. You know, you mentioned different uh, skill sets. I think it's important nowadays to, you know, I mean, they used to say you sh you shouldn't try to wear too many hats, but I think you got to now. You know, you, <laughs> some days, I mean it, man. You want to yeah. stay working. Yeah. Some days I'm the songwriter. Some days I'm the producer. Some days I am the artist, and some days I'm the side man. Or some days I'm doing this, you know. And same as you, you know, we're all just trying to find our way and find ways to generate revenue. But and and we're lucky we get to do that. Uh, do what we love. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it's not, look, most of us, most everybody, it's, it's a blue collar type existence. Maybe you get lucky lightning strikes and it has for me over the years, but that's because I've been doing it a long time, but, um, but don't do it for the money. That's for, that's for dang sure. So you, you do it because it's a calling, you know, the old adage, you know, uh, I, you know, music chose me and absolutely. And, and so that's just the way I've lived my life. I've been really blessed that, you know, when you've got family that supports you and encourage you, encourages you, that's a huge plus because most people on the planet don't get that. Really great unpacking on that. And and you kind of hit some other bullet points I was going to bring up anyway. And we'll, we may come back to Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that, that was great. The, the, the best interviews are when, it's I'm not, I'm just here listening, right? It's it, it's okay. It's, All right, I love it. It's fantastic. I will ask you this, you know, the hit song, "Just Feel Better." You're one mm -hmm. of the writers on it, and that must have been an incredible experience when that hit the airwaves. And I'd lo I'd love to hear just kind of a a, a brief walkthrough of the writing yeah. process with your friends uh, who also co-wrote with you on it, and then. Um, really just that, that, that production process from kind of, you know, you guys writing it to the demo being mm -hmm. sent out to hearing it on, on the airwaves and it becoming on, on billboard or wherever it, wherever it hit, you know, that, that made it a hit. So mm -hmm. we'd love to hear just kind of the, the story and timeline on that. It's incredible. Well, I, I'll try to be concise, but I sure. will tell you this. The co-writers are Damon Johnson and Jamie Houston. 
uh, both close friends for many years. Damon's from Birmingham. He had a band called Brother Kane back in the 90s. And that's sort of related to how I, Dare Smith, knew about me because the uh, co-writer with Damon and Brother Kane and the producer Marty Fredrickson ended up working with uh, Aerosmith. And and so and that's the connection. And Jamie Houston, uh, I met him in L.A. He's from Nashville originally. I met him at, after about a year living in L.A. And uh, he went on to huge success with uh, with Disney High School Musical, Hannah Montana, all that stuff. Wow. And um, anyway, so Damon and I were touring with John Waite back in the early 2000s, like 2001. And um, uh, one night on a tour, I think we were in Milwaukee. We had the night off. And and uh, instead of going out, Damon and I decided we've been talking about writing. And so, you know, we got together in my hotel room and and just bang around some ideas and one of the seeds of those ideas was just feel better. And we knew we had something and like, but it was getting late and we're like, okay, well, let's leave it. Let's get this documented and we'll come back to it. Well, it was towards the end of John's tour. Damon goes back to Birmingham. I go back to LA and this is before we had zoom or Skype or, you know, uh, to, to write, which most of us have been doing now for several years. Um, anyway, I mentioned it after about a month. I said, Hey, Damien, you remember that idea we started, you know, I write a lot with my buddy, Jamie Houston, and he's, he's, you know, he's hot right now. He's got a lot going on. And I just think he'd be the right guy to bring in on this song. And plus, you know, he's got a connection to Clive Davis and that wouldn't hurt, you know, you never no, know. No. <laughs> and, but um, when we started to write the song, when I started to write the song with Jamie, cause Damon couldn't be there. Um, we were on his front porch of his house there in Venice. And, and as we're writing it, realized this song was deeper meaning for all of us, especially for Jamie and me, because it was about his uh, a close friend who, um, who, who ended up tragically passing away. And, and it was the song was about her, her and, you know, it was very an emotional, very cathartic thing for us to, to go through that process of writing the song. And then sometimes writing can be a therapy. And uh, and sometimes that's the reason we do it is to to connect that emotional core with inside and to share with others and for them to feel that. And, and this song became special to us for that reason alone. No intent of pitching it for it to be a hit song. Right. Those that came later. Um, and when I found out that, oh, you know, Santana's going to cut this song, I was just like, that's amazing. And. <laughs> And they're trying to get Steven Tyler to do it because I sang the demo and, and, and they thought that he'd and, and Clive signed Carlos Santana and Aerosmith. And to connect those two, two Hall of Fame singers, I mean, two Hall of Fame artists uh, would be the event of the year for him and his label. Wow. Uh, wow. And so when that happened, I was like blown away. I just, you know, hundreds of songs you write and then one finally hits and it hits that big, you know, like, holy crap, you know. Um, and then, you know, um, it became a hit internationally. You know, it was released. Uh, most song played in Australia, number one in Italy, a lot of countries, Germany, Japan. And uh, so it was really blessed for all that. Um, and all these years, uh, friends and that had heard the demo, my wife kept encouraging me, you should put out your own version, you know, and you know, one thing led to another. I was in another band or I'm touring and I didn't, I didn't get around to it. Well, now when I was making this album, um, I decided to do my version of the song and to re release it. So, and there you have it. What well, it's, that's so great. And I mean, now what, almost 20 years later, uh, yeah. to come out with, with your version and, and really the original vocal on the track right on the song itself yeah. so I, I think that's great so it, it dropped as a single uh mm -hmm. february 23rd it's out we'll have yeah. a link down below for everybody who's watching and Thanks. listening and yeah, uh I had a, yeah had a chance to check out the music video really really great it looks like it was shot uh somewhere kind of like in a nashville background picturesque half type of, of it yeah half of it was in nashville the other half which i just did a post uh, yesterday on Instagram was shot in Cologne, Germany. Okay. And because I was on tour with the Hollywood vampires last summer in Europe. And we knew that, okay, uh, Rick um, Caballo, who is uh, with uh, dead horse branding, who I work with, who represents me. Um, they uh, Rick um, 
had the idea for the video. He's he's a great artist in his own right and and uh, uh, a visual painter, artist, and video director. And he had this great treatment. Well, one of the ideas was okay. Well, it's a message in a bottle. You know, I'm I'm the narrator as the singer in the song. She said, "I feel stranded." Mm. I'm telling her story, and so it's kind of like, well, how it how do you know about this? Well, a message in the bottle. I'm you know, along a shoreline and a message, I see a bottle and a message and I pull it out and I start reading it. And then this music starts. Right. Um, so I like, well, I need to find a body of water. I'm in Europe all summer. You know, there's going to be bodies of water everywhere. And it just so happens we had a day off in Cologne, Germany, beautiful city. And you got the Rhine river right there. And, and along the shore, especially when the barges come by, you get, you know, the, the waves coming in from the barge, uh, coming by and it it like well this is perfect you know and um so my good friend uh kyler clark who is uh, alice cooper's assistant and also a tremendous photographer he has uh, a website and and does tremendous work he agreed to do it for me you know to film that version for the video which is really cool man it's very scenic and um it kind of completes the storyline and uh, then the rest was shot in Nashville. That's great. And you got to tell me a little bit about Hollywood vampires for a second. So how how did that come sure. about? I mean, working with, you know, working with these names besides, you know, just. It's, it's ridiculous, man. I don't, you know, not that it's like, uh, you know, I mean, it sounds like I'm bragging or name dropping. Uh, no, well, but you're not. Hollywood I mean, vampires, it's just facts. No, it's, well, it is. <laughs> Um, the, for those who don't know, the Hollywood vampires is Alice Cooper, Johnny Depp, Joe Perry, and Tommy Hendrickson. And, um, it was the history of the Hollywood vampires starts back in the early seventies. Wow. Like 1970, it was a drinking club started by Alice Cooper and his rambunctious friends, his dead drunk friends, as he would say, yeah. like, uh, Keith Moon, John Lennon, Harry Nilsson. You know, that whole group of guys, they would get together at Rainbow Room on Sunset Boulevard. And and there's a plaque and upstairs and in, in a booth somewhere, I forget where, that is engraved. The Hollywood Vampires, President Alice Cooper, Vice President Keith Moon, and so forth. And a list of all those. And it was just a drinking club. You know, it was their wild weekend, you know, thing. And so I guess about maybe I'm trying to remember when maybe early maybe 2014 or 15 and they decided Alice decided he wanted to do a tribute album to his dead drunk friends and do one of their songs well that kind of morphed into becoming a band but Johnny Depp got involved and so the first album is a lot of covers and you got an amazing group of you had um um Paul McCartney on there. You had wow. great artists singing, uh, you know, from, I just, I, it's too many to mention, but anyway, uh, the second album, I came in thanks to Joe Perry um, and Tommy Hendrickson and, and Johnny, but Joe was the, you know, was the guy I was already working with Aerosmith. I've been with them for 10 years and, um, and, you know, they were making a change to the rest of the band. So they got Glenn Sobel from the Alice Cooper band on drums and they got me, um, and thanks to Joe, and and thanks to Joe, I'm in three bands: you know, Aerosmith, Hollywood Vampires, and the Joe Perry Project. So he keeps me busy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Chris Wise, who um, there's a strange, really cool connection with Chris Wise. He was playing with Ace Frehley at the time, and Ace Frehley was opening up for Alice Cooper, and Tommy saw him play and said, "That's the guy we need in the band for for the Hollywood Vampires." And Chris is incredible talent um i had worked with chris on the tal bachman record back in 1998 uh, with bob rock at his studio in maui and for those who don't know tal bachman a, a canadian artist that uh had the big hit she's so high um was on columbia records and um and chris you know we hit it off and we're like hey man we're gonna do a lot of work together you know we're both in la well that didn't happen until over 20 years later that we're in the Hollywood vampires together. Wow. Cause you know, past 
Bears. We want different things. You know, I, I end up moving to Nashville. He was in the cult for 10 years. So, so anyway, there's a lot of connections between every. Um, so I always tell people, you know, don't believe what you read. Just listen, let me tell you something. These guys are, 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 are great people. And there's a reason why they're there, where they are, their success. Um, very smart, hardworking, uh, and humble. Um, and, you know, everyone wants to know, can Johnny play? Uh, he's a great guitar player. He started off as a guitar player. Yeah. He was in a, that moved from uh, Florida to LA, you know, with a record deal. And then he fell backwards, like we talked about before, into acting. Kind of worked out for him. So is that true um, about the the Nicolas Cage connection? Mm -hmm. That's a really so. that's a really great story. I, I don't remember all the well, details, but you know I don't know it, the details either. I do know that coming up when you're in Hollywood at the time, and this is I don't know the years exact, but um, you know, early eighties, uh the band ended and I, I think maybe the band that he was in the singer uh, unexpectedly passed and they're like what are we going to do now and you know they're a young man with a record deal in hollywood they're going out and meeting all the other up and coming you know rat pack types you know and nicholas cage was one of them this is probably before he was a known uh star and uh and they became friends and um and i think he turn Johnny on to like, Hey man. And he, he probably said, told him you got a face for film. You should meet my, uh, my agent, you know? And I think, you know, the, one of the first things they sent him out on was nightmare on Elm street. And I think right. that's where it all started for him. And 21 jump street, of course. Um, and, uh, so yeah, you know, I mean, in, in Johnny's a great artist. He's, you know, there's a lot of literature, a lot of music, you know, mm -hmm. he'll go see anybody. Like when you start talking about albums, he's very knowledgeable, um and passionate about it so we the hang is fun we just have a lot of fun and and in the second record we made on the road while in europe in 2018 you know bits and pieces you know uh, in hotel rooms and and um you know that the second album is has a lot more original songs on it we convinced johnny to sing and he, he did his version of uh you know heroes because bowie had just passed and um we're off in yeah. Berlin for a few days. And it's like, well, we still need to record, you know, um, heroes and like, well, we're in Berlin. What, that's where Bowie recorded it. Why don't we just go to the studio where he recorded it? Wow. And so that's what we did. And wow. uh, that was a great experience as well. So we, you know, I just get to ride the coattails of these, uh, these guys and ride on the, the, uh, the private jets and, and live a dream, a fantasy. And then when I come home, you know, I'm the one cutting my yard and no one knows who I am. And, uh, and that's it's the beauty. It of sounds it. like I, the best of both I worlds to me, right? It really is, man. You know, it really is. As long as I'm working. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are times where I'm at home working like now I'm not on the road and I'm here in my studio and it's a mixed bag. You know, I'm writing with some young artists and, and looking to produce some stuff for them. Um, I had this Texas artist, this uh, Caitlin Kohler. She, uh, we had the number one song at Texas Country Radio last year. That's great. And uh, so a lot of things like that. I'm mixing a, a friend of mine's concert. So it's, again, wearing a lot of different hats, but it all works together. You know, I, it, 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 you get better. I'm a better mixer than I never thought I'd be a mixer. And I really don't think I'm consider myself that it's just something i can do you know it's and it's addicting i, I mean let, let's be honest right it it's oh, it's a rabbit hole man you oh go man i mean the knobs and it's just you know a being stuff 0 0.0 db 0 0.01 db difference it's you know it it's i'm into it yeah no i and at the end of the day it's just like how does it make you feel you know yes. how does it sound yes you get, don't edit with your eyes, edit with your ears. And yep. how's it, how does it make you feel? You know, does it move you? And then, then you're on to something. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I want to, I got to get into, to the Bob rock stuff for a second, but okay. yeah. uh, real, real quick though, Aerosmith. So you've been touring with Aerosmith yeah. for a number of years Any any, anything just to just kind of paint the touring canvas with that as well. But besides Hollywood vampires, how did that come about? Obviously Joe Perry, was the 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 main contact yeah. it looks like but well, um, not originally not originally okay you know, uh, 
Joe and I became good friends. I mean, I, I, I hate to say, I mean, I think we are friends, you know, I always look at them. They're my boss. Sure. And, um, but you know, I hear from Joe from time to time, a text or, or something and about what's going on. And, and, um, but originally, uh, the, the, the connection was, I mentioned Damon Johnson, a co-writer on Just Feel Better, who and I, he and I had toured together with. We were in a band called Whiskey Falls um, back in the mid 2000s, around 2007, um, which was a country band. But really, if we came out in the 70s, we would have been a rock band. It was kind of like, um, uh, well, Damon now plays with Leonard Skinner. I was going to okay, say, Skinner, so Skinner kind of comes to mind for that yeah yeah, yeah well we I always I always would say we were it was two guys from alabama two guys from california right uh a lot of harmonies yeah you know kind of eagles type vibe but i always said we were sweet home alabama meets hotel california that was our sound i love that we had multiple multiple lead singers but it had a little more you know fire behind it a little more guitar and um so we were having success with that. I mean, we're doing well. And country radio was like, that was the the only place that we knew we'd have at home. And um, and because a lot of country music fans are classic rock fans. And um, so we we were having great shows. We're building a huge fan base. We had we're at <clears throat> we're in the top. Uh, we're at like 26 with a bullet on the top 40 chart. And then the next weekend, the economy crashed. Wow. And we went to a recession and everything kind of went away. But it happened to a lot of artists, a lot of labels folded. You know, our tour support was a sponsorship with Amco. Uh, we wrote their theme song. And we did a lot of creative things that bands weren't and artists weren't doing at the time that um, uh, allowed us to 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 kind of knock down the door a little bit. Right. Um, anyway, it it we all moved on. And and sorry, I digress into that. No, no, I, it's I all great stuff. Yeah. Uh, so Damon, um, you know, his partner when he was starting off, a uh, creative partner was this guy, Marty Fredrickson. They, um, Marty is a great songwriter, producer. Uh, they, you know, and he started off in Los Angeles and had a lot of success. And his first successes was producing and writing with Damon, the band Brother Kane out of Birmingham. And they were a 90s rock band. They had a big singles called uh, Got No Shame. Hard act to follow. Uh, I've heard of them. Shine on. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Um, so Aerosmith um, heard about. Well, actually, Brother Kane opened up Aerosmith, and they loved Brother Kane and and the songs. And like, well, who's this guy working with them? And and so they met Marty, and so Marty started working with Joe, and then with Stephen. And Marty, you know, co-wrote some of. The, he wrote Jaded with Stephen, and. Mm -hmm. He co-produced some of the albums with them and and many songs. And so they trusted Marty's opinion. And then when the opportunity came in 2014, when they needed a guy who could sing with Steven, and when I say sing with Steven, it, it's full voice, a third above a lot <laughs> of times. Um, and, you know, it, that singing is the number one thing in that situation with that band. And then keyboards, you got to play Don't Want to Miss a Thing. But there's a lot more going on than you realize when you listen to Aerosmith songs, especially the stuff in the 80s and 90s. Um, so, and you got to play, I play acoustic on a few songs like Pink and um, Jaded, Seasons mm -hmm. of Wither, um, which I always love doing that. I love getting to play guitar. Anyway, so Marty recommended me because he saw he knew me for years because of Damon. He saw Whiskey Falls and I'm up there playing acoustic and playing piano and playing bass on a song, playing mandolin on a song and singing all the high parts, all the, wow. you know, the, and anyway, so he, he, thanks to him and, and to Damon, they had confidence in recommending me, which is in this business, your recommendation has got to mean something. And, and that's part of your reputation. So um, I was grateful to those guys and, I basically was visiting mom uh, for Mother's Day. Um, you know, her Mother's Day wish, she still plays at this church, was me and, and her and my dad to get up and sing a couple songs. So it's Mother's Day. Nashville's three hours away. So my wife and I go down and I get a no caller ID phone call right before we're leaving to go to the church. And it's from Stephen from Istanbul. And, um, 
I I thought at that point in time, well, they're already over there. They've 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 got their situation taken care of, uh, and so it was kind of out of the blue, really. And you know, I go to you know finish up the conversation goes really well with Stephen. We connect on many levels, um, and he thought it was cool. I was going to sing a couple gospel songs with mom playing piano at the church. And anyway, uh, that's so after so, church, I said, so mom, right. I got to, I got to skip brunch. I got to get back to Nashville. And, uh, of course she's excited the p- possibility and we all are. And so basically I get back to Nashville and I start packing, I start charting and downloading whatever Aerosmith songs I have, you know, that weren't in my phone, right? you know, and, right. and, and uh, you know, charting stuff. And, and, and then you take, I stayed up all night and had n- just enough time to take a shower um, and, you know, get to the airport, fly to Istanbul, which I don't know, it was like 14, 15 hours. Wow. And the whole time I'm woodshedding, right? Cause you know, right. Yeah, I gotta right. This right. And, and, and the one thing I learned, I didn't know then, but I know now the set list that they said, be ready to know these songs they change it immediately. They of course. just, you know, every show it's like, uh, nah, I think we want to play this one, you know, and they have that prerogative. And, and, and the way they decide a song list is usually about an hour or two before showtime. So, and we're all scrambling and I'm in the new guy. And so that first tour in Europe, um, you know, I'm, always waiting to see what the set list, what song I'm going to play tonight that I've never played before with these guys and in front of 20,000 people. <laughs> uh, so I take the flight to Istanbul, get to Istanbul. I check into the hotel, take a quick shower. They take me to the venue. Uh, well, it was kind of a pre-production day because it was going to be the first show, the tour. Yeah. And a production day, I guess. And I meet Steven. And of course, I'm meeting the whole crew and it's like, you know, 100 people, you know, and it's just like, uh, and I'm, I haven't slept in two days at this point. So we go to Steven's dressing room uh, Marty said to me, he says, now he's going to want you to, the first song he's going to want you to sing is crying because it's one of the higher harmony parts. It's like he gives up to an F or E flat and, um, and you got to do it full voice. Right. So, Man. um, fortunately I thought ahead of like, maybe I should learn to play this on guitar too. Um, which, you know, I learned on the piano, but it's, it's not, you know, you got the intro, which is, it's, you know, it's a little different. It's B flat C uh elf g da, 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 da. you know and then you go you know to a different key you know for a to a anyway right. um so i learned it and we play through the song we get to the end of the first course and he just stops like this you know and he gets steven's really emotional and emo- in a beautiful way and he's like his eyes are almost teared up he goes where have you been and i'm like uh, and i'm emotional because I had slept in two days. I'm on adrenaline and this means a lot to me because I love this band. I love this music. It's my kind of rock and roll and I get to sing, you know, I get to sing with the best singer in rock and roll. I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. Right. And I get emotional. We hugged it out and um, it was a beautiful moment, you know, wow. and then I get on stage with the band and, and we're jamming. They want to hear me play. And couple of songs that we jammed on we never played that tour <laughs> which was funny yeah. to me um you know we played stop messing around that joe sings the old yeah. Fleetwood Mac song, and yeah. i take a solo and i'm like okay it's not my i'm a singer first i'm a singer who plays so soloing i can do uh but it's not my forte and they just thought it was amazing because i'm i'm a little messy you know in a good way i'm 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 from the backwater, man. I'm probably gospel, you know, Jerry Lee. And, and, um, I don't know. I just, I, I banged it out. I'm a banger. And they, they just thought it was cool. And I'm like, well, okay, all right, good deal. You know, it works. Uh, and then we jaded, which is an acoustic. They want to hear me play acoustic. So we played jaded. And what I didn't know, much like the first tour, the live arrangements, um, is that, towards the end of the song, there's a place where the band stops and Steven's left hanging over holding a note. And I'm a third above full voice. And I'm like, I immediately knew what was happening, but you know, I wish I'd gotten a bigger breath, you know, <laughs> I'm like, but by God, I'm not going to let go of this note. You know, I'm going to hold it. 
and I'm starting to see stars, you know, because Steven's like showing me off. He know he's kind of like playfully looking like he's looking at a watch and we're just holding that note and he's looking at me and he finally lets go. And I'm like, thank God. And then the band comes back in. Now, my, my band, right. And at that moment, right, right when the band comes back in, they all turned around and smiled. And that's when I knew I had the gig. That's so, so cool. Which was, was pretty cool. So then I walk off stage and they're all really sweet to me, very nice, and 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 it was great. And then I walk off stage, and I meet my tech, uh, uh, Bruce Hendricks, uh, who we call Haystacks, um, and he's from West Virginia, and he's got that, you know, beard and West Virginia accent. Uh, he goes, "That was amazing. You've got so much to learn. I don't know where to begin." And he was talking about the rig, you know, I'm like, oh, okay. So we're going to send the keyboard and a couple laptops for sounds uh, and to have the the tracks that were, you know, they multi-tracks from the previous tour to learn and what to sing. Because, mm. you know, it's very detailed. It's like, okay, the mapping of the keyboard, you know, could be four different things going on. Right. And, you know, piano here, strings here, you know, samples, whatever. And then also, <laughs> you know, when to sing. You know, which is my number one job, like sing this line, skip that line, sing the first three words of the third line. Now sing all the fourth line, you know, and my lifesaver was using an iPad, uh, which because it was too much information to retain. Right. And especially when every set was different. Right. And so I could use a yellow highlighter, like sing that line. You know, and there's a lot of stuff, you know, because you've heard these songs over and over. But when you sure. get some of the deep cuts. And the live arrangements, you know, I would be in my my dressing room an hour before showtime looking up on YouTube. When's the last time they played this song and how did they end it? You know, because <laughs> they they're busy doing their thing. They're not worried about me. And I'm like, why is it? You know, all right. I guess I'm on my own here, you know, and that's, that's fine, so funny. You know? That's so funny to me, though. Like it's it's Aerosmith and, and you're still looking up on YouTube for a reference. You know what I mean? That's well, that's just funny. We're gonna, we're going to do chip away tonight. It's got a lot of, I love that song and, and it's right up my alley, you know, playing wise and singing wise. Yeah. And you know, it's like, Oh yeah, they, they don't end this the same way as the record. It's a little, or the recording, it's a little different, you know, and it's minor things, but if you don't catch that, it's like, Oh, they don't, they don't go back to that, you know, or this is a bar less here, you know? So, um, you know, that that certainly kept me on my toes. But you know what? It's moments like that that really brings out the best in you, keeps you on your toes. And, um, you know, I'm always trying to find things like um, I play with my with Damon's band, Brother Kane. I've been in part of that band for the last couple of years. And we got a couple of shows coming up um, in May in uh, Houston. Um, and there's things that I've never done before. Uh, to make it work in the context with that band. But I, if it scares me, I'm like, okay, we'll see if I can do this. Can I pull yeah. this off? You know, yeah. it keeps you alive, keeps you learning, keeps you growing, you know, um, otherwise, Super important. You, well, you get stagnant and then you're yeah. done. But it's, it's, I would say in today's world, as fast paced things move, it's, it's, it can be difficult to stay on top and keep up, but I do what I can, you know, um, I never fail to try to, you know, learn something new. Oh, I got to learn how to make a lyric video. Well, okay. I'll figure that out, you know, and, uh, yeah. you know, whatever you got to have to succeed and to keep going and moving forward. Well, whatever you're doing seems to be working. I, I, I think that's, well, a safe, say that, man. I think that's a safe bet. I think that's a safe analysis. And, um, as, as we, we kind of round off the interview and, and start circling back around, I definitely, I got it. I got a couple other quick questions, um, some fun questions, but yeah, Bob Rock, real quick. I, I just, oh yeah, I gotta, sorry, I, we get to that. I gotta, yeah, I gotta, gotta I gotta have a, a fanboy, you know. I mean, even fangirl moment. Like, I, it's, it's just yeah. Bob is, wow, um, you know, real, real huge production uh, influence yeah. for me, and a anything he did, I've learned so much from him, mm -hmm. and the fact mm -hmm. that you've had first degree, um. Uh, history with him is really amazing. So I, I'd love to just hear a little bit about Bob Rock and and how you've worked with him and just any any amazing moments with him. 
that come to mind. Well, Bob is amazing. He, he's, his ears are second to none. You know, he was yeah. a mixer. You know, he's had he had his band as a guitar player, the Payolas. Yep. So he's a great guitar player. I think being a musician and and and, and if you're an engineer goes a long way. You know, um, just to speak the same language. And um, you know, so he was known as a mixer. I think like think of Slippery When Wet, mm -hmm. Bon Jovi, uh, a lot of the Lover Boy hits and those records whether you're not try to remove yourself whether it's their kind of music or not but sonically speaking superior sound absolutely you know absolutely and so Any, when anything Metallica, he did anything he yeah. touched sonically yeah. was like right you can hear it you don't yeah. even know and uh, anyway I, yeah so go ahead continue i mean i wish I, I i wish i was smart enough to learn and ask more questions when i had the chance to work with them but um you know, we I was with uh, Tal Bachman band, and we were kind of the first band to work at his studio that he had built there in Maui, off the North Shore on Haiku Hill, and it was beautiful. You know, plate glass window, you can see all the North Shore, you can see the whales, and wow. you know you're there for a couple months, and everyone's like, you come back to L.A. and you're like, well, I thought you were in Maui, you don't have a tan. I says, yeah, I'm in the studio all day looking out at the ocean. You know, <laughs> I had a studio tan, right? <laughs> um, but, um, uh, it was exciting. You know, I learned a lot, you know, we, uh, we did pre-production about the first week or so, and we had recorded like, I don't know, maybe 18 songs and it got down to, to the 10 or 12 it's on the album. And, um, as we're doing pre-production, you know, Bob being a guitar player, you know, I, I'm on a B3 and, and using synths and stuff. And, and I don't think I felt like he wasn't to be honest, that he was into me and what I was doing. You know, I think he was just focused on other things. Sure. So, but I really worked out my parts. I'm like, listen, whatever you do in this business, in any business, be prepared. It takes away the anxiety. Uh, be flexible if, yeah. if your idea isn't working. Um, and be early. You know, yes. in, our, in, in the Twitter world, if you're on time, you're late. Absolutely. And I can't stress that I can't stress that enough to young musicians and artists coming up. Just don't assume. Don't assume that you're that good that you can't be replaced. Anyway, um, so I went into it like, well, man, after the first few days of pre-production, I'm like, I want to take a keyboard to back to the where we were staying in Maui and really like, put some headphones on. I really want to work out some stuff here. I want to be so ready because I'm I'm not sure if he's into what I'm doing. You know, I was a little nervous. Sure. So when it came to the day, after we got the basics, the drums and the bass, it came time to do the keys. And he likes to do the keys before guitars. Some producers do it opposite. And Interesting. He has reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. He. I always looked at it, and what I've done with producers in the past is, you got the the rhythm guitars, the bass, the drums, and and maybe you don't have the the solos yet or anything like that, but put on keys is like yeah, sometimes like the icing on the cake, you know, whatever is missing. Yeah. But in this case, he wanted the keys first, which, okay, all right, fine. We had, we had the basic rhythm guitar stuff um, to work with. And man, pretty much in one day we knocked out all my stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, man, they just, they wanted to get me in and out the door, you know, so they can move on, you know? And I'm like, they're not going to, well, they're going to keep any of this, you know? Well, the record came out and everything I played was on the record. Wow. And there's like, three, there's like three or four songs where I start the song and I'm like the hook. And so I felt like, well, my hard work and never assuming paid off because what I'd worked up, you know, I think he was, you know, sometimes guys, they don't give it up. They're not going to tell you how you know, this is great, you know, and Bob's very stoic sometimes. He's very focused. Right, and I right, right. Kind of um, but maybe, later- Maybe he, perhaps he, if if I were to take a guess, and I, this is just speculation, he's, if something's not an issue, he's just not going to say He's anything. not going to worry about it. Well, right, that's the thing I think you have to understand nowadays is that you can't wait for someone to give you a pat on the back or give you right, praise. They just right. assume- you're here for a reason. You're a pro. Unless something is wrong, all right, great. That's good. That works. Next. 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 You know? Next. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, and 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 that was a good lesson to learn not to be so sensitive to that. And um, 
yeah, it was, uh, you know, he hadn't, strangely enough, I don't think, like, he had a great B3 there, but he hadn't used it, and he hadn't, like I was explaining to him, like, I, my early days in Los Angeles, I did a record with this artist, and there was two keyboard players. It was me, because I was there because singing, and I did a lot of the piano, and I did some string arrangements, but the other guy was this key, this Hammond player, and he was, like, a Hammond player. Like, right. I mean, they called him the Reverend, and he <laughs> taught me everything about three. Like it's, you know, it's a very dynamic instrument. It's like a singer where you you hold a note straight and then you hit the Leslie, just like a vibrato comes in at the tail end of it. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. the fundamentals, the different sounds. This is the New Orleans setting. This is the flutes. This is the pad. You know, this is the John Lord, you know. Yes, the John uh, Lord. The Jimmy All out. <laughs> not so okay anyway um and you know and i've i've i you know and it's all in the expression pedal that's where the magic is you know on a b3 right. anyway right. uh i got to pull out on the one song uh there was a ballad called you love like nobody loves me which i started on the Wurlitzer. i came up with the opening figure and then there's a b3 in there and and he was like he he, he the, probably the biggest compliment i got from him was like wow he said, I didn't know you could do all that, you know, and it was like he because I want to fix something. And he's like, you're not fixing that. <laughs> that was perfect, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, OK, cool, man, you know. So um, but I, and years later, I came to Maui to um, sing with Stephen for New Year's mm. um, because it's 2018. And Bob, you know, it's Shep, um, Shep Gordon's house at this party that uh uh, everyone's there and I walk in and my wife and there's Oprah Winfrey and, you know, there's, you know, all these amazing, you know, people, they're just people, but you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Uh, and, but Bob rocks there and I run right over and we talked and we had a lot of great, th he was so complimentary and he talks about, Hey, that was a good sounding album. He says, yeah, it is. You know, um, I don't think the album did as well as, as Columbia hope, but the single she's so high, I think went to number one. Yeah. It did really well. I still hear it all the time, you know, like in Home Depot and Walgreens and places like that. But uh, um, no, Bob, Bob, Bob was, uh, you know, he's well deserved of all the accolades. He is, he's uh, one of the best. It, I'll ask you one other question on him, and then we'll we'll start we'll start wrapping up. But anything that really stood out specifically for you? that was different working with him other than any other producer. Just want to hear your thought on that. Um, no, uh, I guess the, the thing was he was, he's an engineer, you know, even though he's a guitar right. player too. Right. I think he was more focused on, you know, everything, the details, you know, Full which picture. were beyond my understanding. He's telling, he's yelling at his second, you know, do this, do that, and whatever. And um, some of it is the sub mixes he was doing. The, you know, he had uh, for uh, for the guitarist, he had um, multiple amps set up in the uh, in the tracking room and had like a matrix. Like, oh, you want to hear the Fender with the Marshall? You know, combine them or whatever. Are these three together or thirty right. percent of that? Which now with Pro Tools, we can do all that stuff. You know, a lot of things right, right. so easy then. Um, you know, and he was one of the early producers to really jump on board full throttle with Pro Tools. And, um, and you know, I there's a lot to be learned from what he did on those earlier records. Some people, you know, it's not their cup of tea. Uh, but I think that at the end of the day, it's about um, great songs and how does it make you feel, you know, and um, bringing out the best in that artist and who they are and not making, you know, there are some producers who, you know, regardless of the artist, it sounds like that producer produced that album. I right. think Bob lets those guys, he, he, he's artist driven. Uh, he just brings out the best and he's a great engineer. So he knows they get great sounds. So sonically, you know, it's him though. That's the, th it's like, yeah, of course me, it's yeah. his, his low end is just unmatched. I can't. Yeah. I can't find anything that really feels as good as as his. It, 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 from the well, black album. Why would you? Yeah. Yeah. If it's working, why would you change it? You know. Right. Yeah. Right. Works. Yeah. Um. Chicken piccata. 
I hear you make a a, a slam in one. <laughs> well, you know, those early days of waiting tables in Los Angeles, there's the benefit. I've worked in some really good restaurants and I picked up a few things, you know, growing up in the South, it was a different diet, you know, and so um, I don't eat the same way anymore, but uh, that's one of the, uh, the, you know, if I splurge on a night, I can whip up some chicken baccata. Um, but there was a lot of things that, you know, I used to hate asparagus because it was always out of, a, out of a can growing up. And I'm like, oh, this is what this is supposed to taste like. You know? <laughs> oh, garlic. The garlic is amazing, you know. So, yeah, you know, I, um, I like I'm a novice, not even novice. I'm worse than that. I, I, I enjoy it. I think you can be I could see myself going into that world because you can be really creative and it's it's fun to do. But uh I don't do it as often as probably my wife is a really good cook too. So um, I let her take over those duties most of the time because she's better. That's that's great. Well, and I also heard or read about uh, two Chihuahua uh, rescue pups yeah. that you guys have yeah. uh, Lenny and Cowboy, they're, they're, I believe. Yeah, they're a mess. They're, uh, <laughs> they're, we love them. They, you know, they're Chihuahuas, you know, and, you know, you fall in love with them because they're rescues. You know, Cowboy came first and yeah. he's all of like five, four pounds. And, uh, you know, he was in a puppy mill, you know, and poor thing. Wow. And wow. so he'll never be the same, you know, yeah. but he's, he's got a loving home now. And then we got Lenny about um, less than a year ago from some friends who rescue pets that he was found abandoned off the side of the road. Oh, man. And uh, he has issues. Uh, you know, he, he has anxiety and, and he can have, um, you know, uh, seizures. So he's on meds to help with those things, but they're sweet dogs and they're great company for my wife, Kim, when I'm on the road. Yeah. But they're two yeah. perpetual toddlers. They're like two toddlers forever. <laughs> and to, to kind of wrap things up, um, I've got a something that I, I like to do it's called the the shootout and right. i basically uh -oh. just fire off. it's it it sounds like it's horrible but it, it's not uh, i'll fire okay. off one word and you just fire off the the first word that comes to mind um and it they're all the words are related to the the special guest on the show so yeah it, okay. nothing nothing all too right. crazy for you uh keyboards. all right um banger Love it. Studio. Inside the studio, so I don't have it. I have a studio tan. That's the first thing I thought of. Oh, studio, studio tan? Yeah, gotcha. tan. So, yeah. Tan, okay. All right. Tan, yeah. <laughs> Stage. Or I could say, or I could say studio, it's a, uh, a, a uh, money pit. Yeah, that absolutely. Too. Absolutely, right? Mm -hmm. Um songwriting uh therapy santana um just feel better Love <laughs> it. no santana I, i'd say um you know santana i always think of santana i think of you know um of um woodstock yeah and what amazing that's really where he came to life, you know, and that's, that's the real Santana, you know, that, that music, you know, anyway. No, that's great. Uh, Steven Tyler. He's a crooner. Wow. I'm sorry. That's more than a word. Wow. You know, sure. Everyone knows him from his, his over the top, you know, on stage persona and, and his, the way he can deliver lyrics like a, and sing like a drummer. He is a drummer. Yeah. And, and all, all the, you know, the, the percussive high demon, the screaming stuff, but really, man, his ear, his intonation and his sense of phrasing are Sinatra on a level, another level altogether that I know as a singer to sing with him. You know, when I'm trying to match his articulations and phrasings, it's brilliant. Wow. And, and you know, his dad was a pianist, and so he grew up 
laying under the his piano under the the piano his dad was playing you know the grand and his dad would ear train him you know like intervals you know and so wow. he can hear those things he's still it's it's like i grew up my mom playing piano and there's just things that i'm always up to ear at such a young age which is huge if you get them at a young age children uh work with them and we know what the power of music can do to young minds and how and not just musically so yeah now that that's i'm I'm glad that we we went back to that for a second that's really yeah, interesting good, good yeah yeah uh nashville yeah. um growing absolutely uh alabama um crimson tide makes sense uh <laughs> california well, you know, if you're from alabama you know damon and i are from alabama he's an auburn fan i'm an alabama fan we managed to stay in a band together. That, from, that's from, that's a miracle. Yeah. If you're from Alabama, there's no pro sports. So it's either Alabama, Auburn. You got to pick one. We don't trust anybody that says they root for both. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, and it's usually your father, or whatever he root for, rooted for. Or if you if you don't like your father, then you go the other way. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Calif California. <laughs> Man, uh, California. I think of this the Laurel Canyon. Yeah, the whole sound. Yeah, that's why I went there. I, I loved all the that music, the Eagles, Joni Mitchell, Crosby, Stills and Nash. Um, you know, so many. From that yeah. Era that. Yeah. I love, I always love the vibe. You can't help but feel that way when you're there. It feels magical as well. You know, if I go back, I, I eventually wouldn't, I could move back to California, not necessarily, not, not Los Angeles maybe, but um, you know, maybe another part. I like the central coast and I like San Diego a lot too. It, it really if is magical. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, last but not least pizza. Um, Light sauce. Good sure. crust. Yeah. I, 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 back up. I, see, I think of these things like, no, New York. <laughs> you know, see, it says it all right there. It's a you New York you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong in New York pizza. You can't. Um, This is this has been absolutely amazing. Uh, one last question for you. Well, uh, actually, no, because we need we need to talk about future plans. So you've got some exciting yeah. stuff coming up next. And um yeah. folks can can look forward to we were talking a little bit briefly before we started the interview mm -hmm. uh a full album that is about yeah. to release later in the year uh so let, let's just kind of touch on that real quick and then we'll wrap it up yeah thanks man um yeah i'm gonna put out you know just feel better is out right now which you can see the video on youtube um you know on the socials uh and we're gonna release more singles leading up to a full album that'll be coming out in September. And, uh, and I think the exact date of release right now is September 13th. And basically the, the genesis of why I did this record while I was with Aerosmith in 2019 in Las Vegas, um, I needed something to do because you're there for a month at a time and then you go home and then you come back and you're there for a month. And, and I have a great setup there when we were doing it you know kitchen and a wash and dryer and all that things you need but i'm not a gambler and i'm not a partier so you play a show and then what are you going to do on those days off you know uh you can get outside i'm not a golfer either and those times in the summer months when it's over 100 outside i really don't want to go out so you can only watch so much netflix or whatever and so many shows you can go see and dinners and etc so I thought I needed something to do. I needed a project. So I said, hey, you know, I'll make an album. You yeah. know, I was still co-writing because, you know, I would do this, you know, and, and co-write or whatever. Sure. So I have my mobile rig that I take with me everywhere. My publishing company is called Buck on the Run Music. And so that's what I did. And I made this, you know, this album. And then I had it mastered the week before we shut down. Wow. For, um, 2020. And I thought, well that's it. I can't put any money into this to promote it. Uh, cause we don't know what's happening. I need to hang on to every penny. Right. Yeah. And as the, as the pandemic moved forward, um, many things happened. Some of the, I, I, I realized 
I mean, I, I kind of got away from music for a few months there. Um, and then I came back to it all and I realized, well, I don't want to say that anymore. And I started eventually writing new songs. My dad passed away in 2021. Um, I wrote a song that's related to him and stuff that felt more meaningful to me. Um, some older songs like Just Feel Better um, that fit with the new ones that I was writing. And, and so uh, the song I wrote about my dad's called Tongue and Groove, and that's the name of the album. And Tongue and Groove was something that he would say to me when I was a little kid in Shady Grove, Alabama, and there would be a tornado warnings. And he would say, son, this house is built. Tongue. He was proud of me. We added onto the house that was built tongue and groove and it would withstand any storm. And I, I just, you know, a little seven-year-old kid, what does tongue and groove mean? It just sounded weird. And uh, of course, that always kind of stuck with me. And we're going through this storm of this pandemic and and things, and it just kind of rang true to me. And and I had uh, my good friend, Peter Stroud, who plays uh, lead guitar for Shell Crow. Yeah. Uh, he was over and, and <clears throat> he had this riff and I'm like, and I just started singing it, you know, and it all came really quickly. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the crux of the, what the record is, uh, some old songs, some new songs, and it's all tongue and groove. It all fits together. I love that. That's, that's so cool. Um, I want to ask you a question that I ask everybody, which is typically the last question of, of the show. Um, if you could go back in time to your 15 year old self, knowing what you know now, uh, what would you tell them as advice or anything, you know, spirituality, any, anything, anything along those lines? Um, I would tell him, and I don't mean this in any way that I'm not grateful for where I'm at and what I get to do for a living, but I would say, learn another skill set that you can, you enjoy, you know, um, you know, our, my professor in college, who was a, a brilliant mind and music, you know, musical genius, he said to us, children, if there are two young adults, if there are two things in life that you're talented at and passionate about in music, you know, it's like, hard. you know, it's so difficult that it, if you love... I don't know, uh, being a machinist as much. Some people, when they choose it for a career, it becomes, um, I don't know, it's it's never what you thought it would be. And and those of us, those who have another career and then still can play music on the weaver, they still have that joy, that excitement. It sometimes can get lost along the way. Um, and I do think that I would, I, I would have like a friend of mine who's a bass player and he's been playing with everybody for years. He's also, he's, he's a, a brilliant wood craftsman. He builds cabinets and he builds all these other things and he loves it. He's got a great shop and um, he loves it just as much as playing bass. And it gives him another thing outside of music to do. Yeah. That he's really good at and it's artistic and creative. Um because we're all artists and whatever whatever we're doing, if it's really what we love to do and it's a calling to us, you know, um, whether it could be the best attorneys are creative, you know, mm -hmm. and, and being creative. So anyway, that that would probably be it. It's like, look, don't stop. You know, you're going to do this. I knew at a young age, when I started singing in churches and, and I saw the reaction and got the attention. I'm like, I love this. I want to keep doing yeah. this. You know, yeah. I think I'm. I think I'm pretty good. And I'm, I know I got, a, I still got a lot to learn, you know, that's the thing, but um, yeah, maybe that learn another skill, do something else too, you know, besides just music. It, it adds. I you think, enjoy. Yes. Yeah. And, and it really adds to a more enriched life, I believe. And it takes the, it, it takes the pressure off. Yeah. Well, and I always kept thinking I would do that, but I would get so busy. And fortunately, I would busy, you know, touring or working this band. We had of a record deal. We're making a record. You're focused in on that. You're not thinking about, oh, maybe I should learn how to, I don't know, do programming. You know, not that I would want to do that <laughs> necessarily, but for instance, you know, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the guys in my uh, uncles were 
could build a house, you know, they, they were good craftsmen in that way. And I probably, if I'd listened to half of what my dad tried to teach me, then maybe I could have been too. So. But then again, maybe you wouldn't be on tour with uh, Joe Perry and hey, Johnny Depp, right? Maybe, and Maybe not, you know. Who knows? Um, who knows? Yeah, who knows, man? Yeah. Well, th this has been fantastic. Uh, where can folks find you, social media, if you could just audibly put it out, if, if somebody's driving or whatever and they want to look it up later? On uh, Instagram, Buck Johnson Official. That start there and that takes you everywhere. Uh, or if you don't, buckjohnson.com. It has all the links to, to if you want to hear the song Just Feel Better or see the video, it's all there. So buckjohnson.com is easy. Um, in, in Instagram, of uh, Buck Johnson Official, uh, there's a link that takes you to all the portal for everything else to tap into as well. Fantastic. But I have, all, I have all the footage, all the videos, the reels. And there's stuff with me, with Aerosmith, with Hollywood vampires. You know, I, I'll share this with you and I'll let you go. Sure. Um, so last tour, my wife for Christmas, uh, not this past Christmas, but one before, got, mo got me those Ray-Ban stories, you know, that have a, a camera, which are kind of scary. You know, but <laughs> uh, she was thinking... Uh, and I love Ray Bans, you know, the and the Wayfarer type, you know, and she was like, they were a little different, but she said, this will be maybe cool for her on stage. I'm like, you know, that's a good idea. You yeah. know, the perspective for fans, you don't see, you know, and, and that's what I did. I would like, and I, of course, everybody was cool with it. I get permission first. I don't sure. just assume. Sure. <clears throat> so I'm, you know, hanging out on stage, right. And on the stage, right. is me and Johnny Depp and Chris Wise, you know, we're getting ready. And I got my glasses on guys. Cool. You know, I'm going to hit the button and then, you know, and they'll either say something or, and then when I walk on, they will walk on to, you know, to my platform with the B3 and you see, you know, at this festival, there's 50,000, a hundred thousand people screaming and, and they hopefully get an idea what that rush feels like to go on stage. So there's some of that on there and, uh, and, and a lot of other, you know, stuff about just feel better the video and uh so i'd love to hear from from anybody that was uh interested in checking it out that's really cool i'm gonna i look forward to checking that out myself at some point soon yeah, i definitely look into that that's really really cool well uh any any last words my friend that's it man thanks jason for having me on board man it was a great interview thank you Likewise, you guys have been listening and watching or listening and watching to the Jason Amico show. Make sure you subscribe, follow, share, uh, check out Buck, uh, buckjohnson.com or his Instagram. We've got all those links down below in the description box. And uh, we will see you guys and gals all later. Peace.